All right. Welcome everyone to the session serverless for front ends. Uh, I hope many joined that uh, already um, have been watching yesterday's talk about the next frontier micro front ends. Um, there will be a couple of new stories in here. Uh, also, of course, I want to make the introduction as generic as possible. So if you didn't watch the talk yesterday, then no worries. Uh, I'll still start uh, from scratch. Before we, before we start, though, a um, few words about my person. Hello, I'm Florian. I'm giving this talk uh, at my summer vacation here in the mountains. That's also why I uploaded the video to not be impacted by any, yeah, let's say mediocre uh, internet connection. Anyway, who am I? I'm a solution architect at a, a smaller company called Smartpiot. We are doing mostly IoT and embedded computing. Uh, many projects that we have are in the space of digital transformation. And in any of those projects, we are always using distributed web applications. Partly because we want to, but partly also because the requirements just, yeah, go directly in that direction. Besides my work as a professional solution architect, I'm also an open source enthusiast. I'm a Microsoft MVP for development tools. I'm doing projects in the .NET and uh, web space, mostly JavaScript, TypeScript. And I'm writing a lot of articles for various blogs and magazines. In that space, I have also written a book recently called The Art of Micro Frontends. I uh, would be very happy if you want to grab it. Um, give me some feedback. Always appreciate it. Always try to, to improve here. And with that being said, let's jump right into the topic. And this time I want to start, let's say, from the direction of microservices. Now, Microservices are quite popular, but there is a sales pitch to, let's say, go even more lightweight and uh, go into the direction of so-called serverless functions or serverless computing. And that sales pitch goes a little bit like that. Traditionally, you would have everything somewhere in your hands, right? You would have uh, the requirement of creating front-end logic, some back-end, security would be in your hands, and also, of course, management of a database up to some degree. Sure, you can go to some cloud vendor, but yeah, you get the gist of it, right? So you would need to have the communication, security, everything, how the network works in your hand. And even though microservices are great to some extent, um, there are still, of course, a lot of operational aspects that you may not want to have. And at the end of the day, you actually want to focus on something else than actually wiring the things together. You want to, to solve a problem, right? You want to, let's say, serve a certain business here. And this will usually just be a tiny fraction of the whole thing that you do. Meaning that most of the stuff that you actually spend your time on will be in wiring up things and doing technical work. Whereas, of course, the business you're, yeah, want to give an additional value to, well, is uh, not in that um, technical weaving here. And so serverless gives you that option to actually now say, okay, the security part, I take a third party service database that's already managed somewhere that's fully there. And then I can just focus on a tiny bit of, of uh, backend logic, but all the rest is maybe already somewhere. And also the backend logic, it doesn't need now to go to that level. So, whoa, how is the HTTP request ending up there? You really just focus now on your specific uh, logic or kernel or business domain that you want to implement. And so this whole thing goes in the direction of really um, giving someone else that responsibility, this technical one, and really focusing um, yourself on yeah, what's there. So how can these two worlds, microservices and then serverless, be compared? With microservices, you will need to take care of your runtime. You need to deploy them somewhere, right? Um, and you need to perform the orchestration if you have multiple of those, right? So there's a new microservice. How do you teach the others that this thing is there? Um, you now have finished your microservice. You may, let's say, package it up as a Docker image. But now where does this Docker image run? 
And at the end, uh, what's in that Docker image? That's all the runtime, right? Do you have, I don't know, Node.js with Express? When do you update now Express? When do you update Node.js? How is that version of Express still compatible with the new version of Node.js, etc., etc.? A lot of questions, uh, and those need to be answered. Of course, very often, you want to have that flexibility. But what if you really want to focus on something else? So serverless gives you that. There is no runtime in your hands. Sure, there's a runtime that was predetermined for you. Um, you are now part of that runtime, but the runtime is also updated and taken care of by someone else. Instead of yeah, needing to, let's say, look where to publish it, you publish it to a certain serverless provider, let's say Azure Functions, but it could also be AWS Lambda. And this way, of course, um, you already have a fixed point, you publish it, to this point, right? And it just gets integrated. The orchestration also happens automatically. This this provider then wires it up with all the other functions um, that you have uh, and it, that just then works, right? So no additional work required. All this infrastructure layer now is in the hand of someone else. So serverless gives you a lot of convenience. And in short, that reduces therefore the scope of whatever microservice you write to focus almost exclu exclusively on the domain functionality. So really, it's all about focus and that's all about scalability because at the end of the day, I mean, what are you paid for from your company is not, let's say, <laughs> wiring up these technical bits here, but really delivering this one functionality, right? Um, and giving your company, therefore, an edge on the business. Right, now let's step one, let's take a step back here and let's put it in context with the whole web evolution and also what's then the next step from there, right? So we started, or at least I, in the mid nineties with monoliths and they were great, uh, we were working um, personally. So that was, well, your first website was ready. You were hosting it on GeoCities or some other free provider. And, uh, well, then someone comes with a request and says, oh, this is a dope website, but what is, would be really nice is to have some kind of a user counter or a guest book in there. And so you're like, hmm, where can I get those? And of course, there were some free services around the time to, to provide that. And most of them are working in frames, etc. But, yeah. Uh, if you wanted to be really cool and really embed that, you needed to have some kind of scripting capability. And that was CGI at that time. So I personally wrote Perl. Uh, Perl was great. It was very powerful. Um, in my opinion, quite easy to write. So even as a starter in the development space, I yeah could do one or the other thing. Uh, and uh, that was great. And all the big systems... Uh, Look at Amazon, look at Google. They all started with such a monolith. You could still scale them, doesn't matter, right? You just put them on multiple boxes and have maybe a load balancer in front and that just works. So that that's good. And it was scaling up to some degree. And always here, the back end was also responsible for rendering the front end, right? So the server side rendering was just there. It was just everything in, in one box, the database maybe even on the same machine, and then access to the database, all these layers in there, and it was just working. But then some new things arrived, and uh, I still remember, I think in 2002, 2003, when there were suddenly a really new kind of web application. It all started with uh, Google Maps, because when that was released, it really felt like like magic. Um, you were on a website, but that website was constantly changing. They were loading all these images. You could just pan around and uh, have a look at something and you could zoom in, zoom out. It was just magic, right? Um, how was it doing that? And it turned out they were splitting the front end and the back end part. So they had a powerful API and that was of course capable of maybe doing some initial rendering, but then they were using a lot of this new technique. It was first coined Web 2.0, but that was just an umbrella term of category for these websites. Technical term then emerged as AJAX, Asynchronous JavaScript uh, and XML, but Asynchronous JavaScript and JSON 
soon became um, the de facto standard here. Nevertheless, so what was, well, something like a single page application already back in the days emerged uh, with things like uh, Google Maps or also Google Mail, which was a far superior uh, web uh, email client than the others. You clicked somewhere and just a tiny fraction of the screen refreshed where, for instance, the title and the body of the email was shown. But your search wasn't impacted. Whatever you clicked it was all still there. No long loading white page in between. It was really fluent. It was just a very nice way to, let's say, consume the web and especially such things like emails or maps things where you really wanted to have this tool like or application like behavior and of course apis became stronger and stronger for that dedicated apis emerged uh, apis also for consumption emerged and so the split that you want maybe to have something dedicated for your front end and something for your api became more and more popular and then one other thing happened and that was that uh, native mobile apps came up, right? So suddenly it even another client and uh, they, yeah, were also using some of the APIs, but they also required maybe some new APIs and you were like, mm, okay, uh, now we got the scalability problem in two directions. On the one, we need more backend, uh, well, team members, developers in general. Um, why? Because we have now more and more clients and they require more and more functionality. And we are building already dedicated front-end teams, one for the iOS app, one for the Android app, one for our web client, whatever, right? But the backend, this is where they all go to and they have specialized needs, etc. But the second one was, of course, that some services, authorization services, for instance, required more resources than others. And just putting all the things on one box didn't, let's say, um, fit that those requirements so nicely. So what you wanted is to have dedicated boxes for dedicated services that you could then duplicate up on demand, where you say, okay, now my authorization deck gets hammered five times as much as the average service. So it gets five times more instances than the average service. And that just makes sense. Um, of course, the story isn't all that easy, but that's how it looks like. And quite often for consumption from the outside, there was some kind of a shield or a single entrance in between, uh, something like an API gateway, sometimes also a backend for frontend, whatever you want to name it, there was this, let's say, layer. And it could have a lot of responsibility too, like, for instance, uh, already check in, checking authorization tokens, etc. Already check-ins, maybe quota on API accesses, etc. So that's great. It can shield internal services from the outside world and can be a nice layer in between, nice orchestration layer too. And now we are reaching the point where the same can be said for the front end, right? So you got more and more web applications now, maybe even your Back then, native mobile applications moved away from the model. And now there are maybe already um, web clients too. But they're different web clients, right? They need to be tailored now for, for instance, a mobile experience. And you don't want to have all the functionality maybe in the, let's say, same kind of uh, broadness or variety uh, that you ship in your standard web uh, client for these systems. And so you got more and more and you want to have pieces that go beyond, let's say, the definition of a button, but let's say already a button with domain functionality, like, I don't know, a delete button that shows in a dialogue when it's pressed and that knows what endpoints to call when it's, when it's triggered, etc. And these kinds of reusable domain components, these are now called micro frontends and they can be developed by independent teams and aggregated together in something like well applications but this this time we could just call them application shells because they could be empty without these micro front ends of course that depends on you you can have a let's say already fully fully developed application that just uses additional points from micro front ends and as a matter of fact you potentially already do because even if you use a uh, monolithic page uh, uh, but you include a third party service for instance for your consent management or a chat client right 
Those are micro frontends usually. They come in with their own layout. They come in via a script that many cases opens an iframe to, let's say, shield the, the layouting, etc., from your page. Um, but in any case, these things are there already and you use them. The only question is now, <laughs> are you creating this micro frontend solution are you, or are you just using micro frontends from third party services? That being said, so what are micro frontends then? Um, well, micro frontends are all about scalability in terms of development. They're all about in uh, about uh, empowering um, development teams. So instead of you doing micromanagement, you give the power to the teams and now individual teams become domain owners because they own really full stack front and back end and now they can actually uh, make their own decisions when to deploy, what to deploy um, and the composition is then really done like magic on a certain point that might be on the server, on the client, you decide in your implementation. So let's take the left hand side here, what we see here. Um, you see that there is uh, there are three teams. They are all vertically arranged, which means there is domain expert in there. There is a product owner, of course, but there is, of course, development capacity, for instance, for backend and frontend. And now someone may do a fragment like team A has a fragment. Team C has multiple fragments that they develop and uh, team B just develops a page that now makes use of fragments from other teams to actually, well, be rendered the right way. There are maybe some shared, let's say, functionality to, to use, like a design system, um, which is great because that brings in some consistency. And of course, there might be some uh, architectural foundations, some shared knowledge, uh, for instance, um, what should be done in, in terms of uh, authentication, authorization to ensure that a user uh, is eligible for doing certain actions. Right. And with that being said, right, there are different, let's say, concerns that you now need to take into consideration, which are the same as for any front-end application. So how are you doing routing and page transitions? Um, what about the composition and how do these different um, components that you have there communicate? So what if this fragment from, from team A and one of the fragments from team C need to have, let's say, kind of a shared state because I don't know. Uh, A informs you what you currently have in your shopping cart and uh, one of the things from, from C shows how many items are in the shopping cart. So there must be some kind of synchronization right between the two. And there's of course a lot of uh, let's say knowledge around what you can do when you follow certain patterns. Right, so just to iterate that one point once more, it's really about breaking up specialist teams, which are grouped around skills or technologies into cross-functional teams where you say, okay, we now have teams that really take care about one of your uh, subdomains. Um, in this example, here you see Team Inspire, Team Checkout, uh, etc. And uh, they are always taking care of this one um, domain, right? So Inspire might come up with, I don't know, recommended products, for instance, Team Checkout, everything about your shopping cart, uh, etc. And so they all have their, their, let's say, goals. They know their domain very well and they are ready to implement fragments, uh, backend functionality to make that domain really shine in a software solution. That follows, of course, this two pizza team approach. Uh, so uh, three eight person teams are more effective than uh, one twenty four person team, right? So you would need a lot of, uh, let's say, <laughs> pizzas delivered from Domino for the twenty four person team. But you can make the, let's say, purchase really easily for an eight person team, and that's all about this kind of, uh, let's say, overhead or alignment. So at the end of the day, it's really all about being able to reduce any kind of overhead and give really dedicated work to smaller teams. Um, 
and in such a sense that they don't need to align because sure uh, you can make a split of a 24 person team to three eight person teams but if they always need to sit and join meetings and uh, have let's say scrum of scrum meetings or similar then you have uh, have a problem right um, so that only works really if they don't need to align um, that doesn't mean that it's forbidden to align but really the need for alignment should be reduced to a minimum here. These days, a lot of companies already using microphones. That's an old slide. I would say uh, we can extend that now and um, presumably, uh, yeah, almost everyone in the Fortune 500 is touching micro front ends one way or the other. Um, some of these companies here are, let's say, what I would call pioneers in that space. Uh, IKEA, for instance, has a, a server-side solution that works already since quite a while. Zalando was one of the first companies to really uh, provide also an open source solution. Uh, Otto blocked very actively about it. Um, then, of course, uh, we have a lot of other players in that space. And these days, uh, yeah, solutions like the ones used by Spotify, the zone, or also uh, from our company, the, the open source framework, they are getting a lot of traction and um, yeah, many companies knowing or unknowingly are using them. So it's really not uh, who didn't, let's say, build or use micro front end solutions, but who didn't at this point in time. But micro front ends are not, let's say, the end of the story because we are here in the talk about serverless for front ends. So how does that now come into play? And uh, that comes into play with a new pattern called sideless UIs. So let's have a look what you now have for micro front ends. You still need some kind of a runtime um, because somewhere, right? I mean, you're using, I don't know, React or you combine them on the server, but even then you need to know, right? What's what's the, the syntax for placeholders, etc. Uh, you, you need to decide all that. And every micro frontend also requires that runtime. Now, you also need to deploy it somewhere, uh, either your own server, some CDN, but it's not predefined. So yeah, you need to look up for space and you need, of course, to tell, for instance, your app shell where now this micro front end is. Uh, so if it's on the server, it must be some kind of a resolver. But if, you know, there's just some HTML that goes to the client, the HTML also needs to know where to get it from. And you see that on multiple occasions, if you write micro front ends, for instance, via module federation, you need to insert a URL for your micro front end. And yeah, that's the kind of orchestration that's just required with this approach. Now, if you would go for sightless UIs or serverless for frontends, you wouldn't have a, a runtime, right? There's no runtime. Um, I mean, of course, like with serverless functions, there is a runtime, but it's not your decision to make. That was predefined. So nothing for you to, to worry about. Uh, you would, by the way, also then just um, use an emulator to debug that. Same with uh, serverless functions. So if you, for instance, start a debugging session Azure function, you get an emulator. Instead of publishing it somewhere and needing to decide that, you publish to that provider, right? So in AWS Lambda, you go to the portal, you upload your, your tarball there, you're good. Uh, and that's the same here. So there's this provider where you put it to. But then the result is that it's auto orchestrated, right? So uh, no, no need to tell someone, oh, there's this new micro front end. No, it's already there. Since you published it, it's already wired up for you. So there are a lot of similarities. If you think about uh, micro services to serverless that now emerge in micro front ends to sightless UIs. It's pretty much the same thing. And that even checks if you go through a checklist. So for instance, can you develop in a standard IDE? A serverless, let's say I want to develop an Azure function. Sure, a Visual Studio or even VS Code, it just works. You press F5 there and now this emulator starts, but yeah, I mean, you don't care what starts. Then when you press F5, the only thing that you care is that your code is running. And when you set a breakpoint, it stops there and you can inspect it. And you can, of course, um, get to the bottom of some issue. And that's the same here. 
you should be able to debug it uh, uh, somewhat, right, uh, as mentioned. And yeah, uh, an emulator is what is there for um, AWS Lambda, is there for, for Azure Function, is there for uh, OpenFAS, and now it's the same here. You therefore have loose coupling by default. Um, if there would be strong coupling, the whole well architecture wouldn't work, right? You couldn't just remove a piece. But in serverless, it's all that your thing, your function that you just right now doesn't know the others, right? It just doesn't. Um, there may be some contracts via some events or something, right? But it's not that your system would crash if this event wouldn't be emitted. It wouldn't be very good, but yeah, that's it. And the same is true here. So your one, let's say, um, sightless UI that you have, your module there, doesn't need to, to know what other modules exist. They may emit events, right, for communication, but yeah, if it's not there, it doesn't emit that event. It's that simple. There are, still must be some kind of a, of a self-definition, could call it a manifest, to know what's in there, right? So for serverless, how do you now know what uh, endpoints from the outside or the URLs now should match in that serverless function. And it's the same here. Now, how should an outside know what this one component should do, right? It's, for instance, a menu ent entry or your page or whatever. You need to have this kind of self-definition in there. And at the end of the day, you want to deploy uh, without having this runtime in there, which is great because no need to update that. And it would always just work in the future because this thing is without the runtime, right? It's just one thing just stands alone. There is no, no need for a runtime. Uh, but then the runtime gets attached uh, when it's running. Um, but this runtime may, might be updated. Um, and that's good because yeah, that way the runtime always stays up to date. You don't need to care. Even if you didn't update your, your part in a while, the only thing that you need to ca take care of is dependencies that you take into your modules or of course if there are issues with your modules and you need to do a hot fix. And then, of course, you should update it. But no need for, you know, updates when there is a, something in, in a runtime that you don't control. And the benefit of all of that is, of course, if you publish, it's instantly available. There is really no, no need to say, okay, um, that gets online, but just tomorrow or in a few hours. It will be there. Um, it will be there right at the instant when you published it. Sure, you can maybe prevent that, have some quality gates in between, but that's now up to you for controlling the system. But let's say from the technical perspective, you can just publish it and it's there. So how does it look like in, in practice uh, when we look at um, yeah uh, development life cycle? Someone may start with an application shell, may say, okay, we develop now first version of this. Um, that will be also the basis for an emulator. And um, you know, they bring it up to some point where they say, oh, we included common concerns like um, where do you authenticate to, or I don't know, uh, there's this one button or the pattern library that should be used, etc. or layout. That's all there. And then they publish that. At this point, there might be a, a module development that already went on side by side and then they align and say, okay, that's great, it's working in there. And so you have now a first version where you can go live to. But even better, um, with this first version that was developed and now set to production, the module development of uh, module A, that was there, of course, already at a certain maturity point with the production release, they can just now make more releases, right? They say, oh, there was an issue. So let's just update it and have a version two released. And then maybe a version three. But at the same point, a version two of this application shell is maybe also developed side by side. It's not yet published, but they are still, they're already developing on it. Now, other modules may also start at this point in time, right? They start with module uh, two, they start with module uh, C, they start with all these modules, but again, they are not aligned with any uh, of the other modules and not aligned with the application shell at all. They're just developing and when they're ready, they're publishing. And when they need to update, they are updating, right? So all of these teams, all of these modules have their own life cycle, which is great. And 
the teams may decide what's the life cycle right is it bound to i don't know we release once per sprint is it bound to release in in features whenever we have a feature ready release or is it we really make just some some timelines and then uh, stick to those or some feature packs and when those are ready we, we release they can decide whatever makes sense for them and for different modules that also is good because there might be modules where you know you want to have the fixed release point at the end of the sprint or something like that and for others you want to may want to say but well, makes only sense if we have a new feature in there so that being said the advantage of having such a system is exactly in the staging uh, process so you can now have different environments like here shown four environments and you can have different versions like here the api key management module of some support services uh front end module that's already in in production version 16 but version 21 well that's that's already in all the other environments and you can now even roll back and say oh but for the quality uh, insurance environment we we put it back to 20 or for our functional acceptance testing environment, we put it back to 19 for whatever reason. And you can just do that now. You're really free of selecting your features and put in different environments, different versions, depending on whatever business need you have. And that's, that's just great. At the end of the day, how might that work? Um, I will use an example framework called Pyro to showcase that. But what I can tell you is uh, not many pieces, let's say from a high level point of view. As an end user, you access uh, the application shell in case of Pyro called the Pyro instance. And that loads all these serverless modules um, called pilots here. So these are like micro front ends or, or modules for application. And so that's the whole front end application that a user gets at the end of the day. And all of these things are acquired from now the Pyral um, service. And that's like your serverless function provider here, right? And so with uh, Pyral CLI, with the tooling, you're able as a developer to publish or update these modules, right? Or even, you know, start a new module, um, which is then used together with this emulator. Now let's see an example. Um, this is kind of a, a Netflix. And uh, what you see is you get your profiles, you can select one. You've got some menu items, favorites, for instance, I click on uh, the heart icon. And if I go now to favorites, you see that this one is there. Now what a new team might do is they might just in it on the uh, command line, a new project. And then they add a little bit of code. Don't worry about that. That's a really uh, fast example. We'll do that uh, faster in a second. In this case, they add uh, some, some random functionality, a surprise me button. That's our React components. Uh, and this setup function that you see here is used to actually, let's say, provide this uh, self-definition. So it couples now this React code that they've written to um, exactly um, the application shell. And now they develop it and they can click it already. It's great. The emulator is running, but what they don't like is that it's empty, right? Because it, a lot of functionality is actually coming from the other modules. So they just say, let's load in the other things. And suddenly you see that the random selection was working all along, just that components coming from other micro front ends are actually, for instance, filling these preview images. And the surprising button already works, which is just great. It's still missing on the on the real application that you see here. So how do you publish it? Well, via this feed service portal. So what we can do is we can just build it, we can pack it, and that creates a tarball. It's very similar to what you may know from um, AWS Lambda. So here you see the TGZ. We can just go there. We can include it. And we can upload it. Now it's there in version 1. And 
it's there on the live application. So it was really published instantly, the team was able to just ship it and uh, the application just got extended with one additional functionality. So let's have a look uh, in our browser. Here we are. You see this one button, it's there. I can refresh the application, it's still there. I can go there, it's loading. It loads this, uh, well, random selection and so it's really working nicely. I can even go into this feed, as you can see here, have a look and say, oh, there is this one random pilot, I can just disable it. And if I do that, you see that it's gone now. But we can do even a little bit more, so let's enable it again, let's see, it's there. We could restrict it also to certain browsers, because enabling and disabling that, well that's that's great, right? Uh, we could even, you know, roll back, etc. But the one thing that's really troublesome is, well, I mean now it's enabled or disabled, but maybe if we want to have it more flexible, that it's enabled for some users and uh, disabled for the others. And rules are there to make this possible. So I could now come up with something, but the easiest to show it is a browser filter where we say, okay, maybe let's just allow it in Chrome. All right, so now the thing is only allowed in Chrome, which means since we're in Firefox here, we don't see it. But if I would use Chrome, then we see, okay, the surprise me button is uh, back and it's working. Sure, we can go back and say, oh, yeah. Let's delete that one rule, right, it's not good, shouldn't have this. This feature also works great in Firefox, so why, why do it? And we can just have it like that. Great, but what we also can see is that consistency is always preserved. So let's log in, let's say we are Jane, and you can now see we have this heart icon. We also have add favorites here and we have a favorites page. There are no favorites yet. Now let's go ahead and let's disable the pilot favorites. Now if I refresh, the button here is gone, that button is gone, and this button is gone, right? So consistently we now removed the favorites and even the favorites page, as you can see, that's, that's gone. This is the not found page. So everything's gone and it's gone consistently because all these components they came from the same source from the one micro frontend called favorites and if it's not there since it's loosely bound it will not register itself if it's not registered it will not be shown and uh, it's just not there and it's really consistently gone and that's just great right it's exactly what you would expect in such a composed system um, if it would be strongly coupled with a problem because then one of the microphones would say oh ah, and then I take from the from the favorites pilot I take this one button and now if the favorites pilot isn't there well the system would just crash it's not good in this case we're not saying this we're just saying we have here a slot and if someone has something we can just register it for the slot and the favorites pilot says, I got something for this slot, and so I register something. So it's not there, it's not registering something, it stays consistent by definition, and that's awesome. What else can be said about this thing? It's fully composed. So you've got, for instance, the browse page, which is the central page of this application, and it comes, for instance, with this browse menu button. We got favorites, we've seen that, and favorites really is uh, what you would, could call at the heart of the whole consistency story. And then we even got uh, a watch, uh, um, yeah, 
micro front end and this one is actually delivering for instance this watch extension and that's a quite crucial extension because it shows the preview and it may have a preview also of the of the video we get a profile micro front end and the search micro front end and so really every aspect there is is covered they got these five central micro front ends and what if we now want to go on and develop our own module here so that all starts with having this emulator we've seen it in the video already but let's do that also ourselves so we pick the Netflix pile demo and we say we want to init a new pilot and uh, let's stay from the naming here cons consistent so that we could just use Netflix minus Palooza pilot so let's use this and uh, as a source we are using our emulator as a target we are using bundler we use esbuild you know me by now potentially i always like to use esbuild and this time we use just the defaults so no need to iterate through all the options All right, then we need to wait a little bit until uh, the piracy is downloaded and afterwards until all these dependencies are downloaded. That doesn't take all too long, it already takes care of templating, it's great. Installs dependencies. And if everything succeeded, we can just go into that directory, see what it's scaffolded for us, and try to run the application. That worked, so let's go in here, let's start VS Code. We got a couple of things here, um, register tile and notification are not actually supported by this. But let's see if we can start it. And here we are. This is the empty app shell, right? Um, as we've seen before, and we can populate it and make it more dynamic. But for now, what I want to do is I want to register something in the menu and we want to register the foo route and maybe have a link in there so like this want to go to foo and all right so let's make a, a menu component here and here's our foo, right? Great. Now we want to have of course a page. This point should be at the foo route. And uh, our route. So you barely see it, but there is something written there. So let's let's make it a little bit better. Uh, let's give it some margins. And then This is already looking good. Uh, 
Great. So this works. And now, of course, the question is, can we publish that? And last time in the video, what we've seen is that it was published just, you know, via the button. But of course, there's a yeah, nicer way to do it, in my opinion. Uh, more complicated, of course, but nicer in that sense that, well, you could just use it also in a CI-CD pipeline. So we would just use a new key. And that's all good. And then we generate it. We get this key. Now, what we could do is we could uh, just run the publish command, say, let's make a fresh build, use our API key, and use this URL. Great. Um, this will publish it to, to here, right? So at this point in time, it's not there. But now that we are publishing it, if that works, it says it worked. We are already seeing it here. We should be able to have now our foo button, which is awesome. So that works. And we can even go a step further. And of course, I'll say, oh, our page isn't lazy loaded here. So let's let's make it a dedicated uh, file. Write a little bit. And then maybe let's export that here. Let's have the page as a, as a lazy loaded construct and instead of foo let's call it maybe palusa change that and let's give it uh, therefore uh, a new version number and maybe a description great so now let's do that again it builds it uses that and it updates and we are now at 110 and if we now load it you see oh it was up Loaded, it was updated, and it even makes it possible to just, you know, go back and set the old version as current. So now it's called foo again, and you can go crazy with that, right? So you are now free to, to just change that, and it's instantly just uh, applying that. And that makes it very powerful. Um, this team now is completely on their own. They are just capable of, of publishing uh, new bits and pieces all the time and uh, the magic ingredient is of course that they don't have a, a runtime they control it this is all part of this emulator that they installed um, and uh, the CLI makes this possible just now publish and uh, have the latest version being shown up right okay. Okay, now since we don't want to have this, we can of course also go in here and stop that from being, let's say, shown at all. And that will be the end of that story. So, all there, all possible. Likewise, of course, and that's also another reason why you want to have such a system for micro front ends, such a serverless system is that you can now just go ahead and uh, for instance restrict access to for instance that specific token and uh, say oh they got in the wrong hands so let's just prevent um, using it all right so with that being said um, that serverless for front ends you can build your own system that works very similar to that. Uh, you got a lot of articles out there that describe how it works. Um, otherwise, you of course 
can can use Pyro. You can create your own feed service. You can of course also use the one we offer. The cloud service is free. We also have a Docker image that's of course commercial then with support etc. But uh, in any case, we have a quite let's say active community. Um, if you have any question, always very welcome to let's say post it in our Gitter chat. Reach out to me on Twitter or follow the Pyro Cloud uh, Twitter account. I wish you all now a very nice conference, a great end of the week, great weekend, and uh, follow me on Twitter, stay in touch, and uh, happy to discuss microphone lens, serverless modules, and all that. Thanks, take care.